So our next up is going to be from Conor Farrell, or Lithium or whatever, and he's going to do a talk on hacking the Raspberry Pi and turning it into a, ra a radio. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. Um, so I believe he has a demonstration. Um, I do, at least. Further ado. Yes, <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much for uh, coming along. Uh, my name is Connor. Uh, you might know me as Lithium on Redbrick. Um, I want to do this talk uh, today to kind of give you a different sort of angle to sort of tech week stuff. I know most things this week will be related directly to computers. I want to go a slightly different angle and maybe give you a few ideas for college projects or, or personal projects. And so hopefully this will give you a kind of a good starting point in radio and how you can play around with it. So a little bit about myself, first of all, I went to DCU uh, between 2003 and 2007. Um, I was a member of Redbrick since uh, 2003, so that's quite uh, a while. I studied physics here, but I think I was interested in radio the whole way through college, and it was in 2008 that uh, I did an exam and got the Harmonised Amateur Radio Examination Certificate. That sounds impressive, it just means you know how to use a radio, nothing more to it. That let me then get licensed uh, to be an amateur radio user. Uh, you might have heard of um, radio hams, especially um, in America. That's what I can do. I don't actually do it, but I do have a license to, to uh, allow me to do that. My main interest in radio is mostly in shortwave radio. It's also known as HF or high frequency radio. And um, it's from that then that um, my interest in radio kind of expanded into other modes like UHF, VHF, and different um, types of modes. So, so what we're going to do here today is probably mostly in the FM bands, and so let's see how it goes. So this is just an overview of what I'll be talking about today. It's it's not an exact um, table of contents or anything, but I'm going to give a brief overview of what radio actually is and how it works. Then I'm going to demonstrate some um, radio receivers and then I am going to demonstrate how you can grab radio signals from aircraft and we're going to do that live and build basically a, a radar system on screen here. After that I'm then going to show you how to use a Raspberry Pi as a radio transmitter and then that should bring us to the end of the talk. So first of all what is radio? Um, I suppose when we talk about radio, uh, it, it, it's kind of an all-encompassing term for both the electromagnetic radiation itself, uh, that is radio waves, and uh, the technology used to actually broadcast it. So uh, when we talk about radio, I, I guess it would mean mostly it's, it's, it's the method by which we would encode information, whether it's audio or data or whatever, onto a carrier signal, onto a carrier frequency broadcast that frequency over the air into open space so that the information can be received and decoded um, by a receiver. There's a lot of physics there on that slide there, so don't worry about it, it's, it's a bit complex. Uh, so what do we actually use radio for? Well, I suppose the obvious one, first of all, is listening to a radio. Um, whether it's just listening to Joe Duffy or whatever you want. Um, also um, included here is television. Um, both audio and, and television use the same technology uh, at broadcast. We use it for telecommunications. Mobile phones uh, use radio signals to communicate with uh, mobile towers or mass and with each other. Uh, we use radio in satellite communications. It's, it's a pretty easy and efficient way to get data to and from satellites and to astronauts in space. Uh, it's also a, a way where we can actually see the universe um, in, in, in a different light, uh, quite literally. Uh, for example, the sun emits radio waves, and Jupiter emits radio waves, and you can tune into those, uh, even with the uh, hardware I'm going to show later. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's used uh, in astronomy and space science as well, and of course it's obviously used in computer networking, such as Wi-Fi. So it's used all over the place. Uh, we probably don't realize how much we do actually use it. Um, so, in order to create a signal, this is kind of um, a brief overview. I, on the top we have the, the transmission end of things. That's how you actually create the signal. On the bottom is, is, is the reception side. So, we get a signal going in. In this case, it's voice or audio. It goes into a transducer. A transducer is just a fancy name for a microphone or a speaker. Uh, we've got 
That then turns it into an electrical signal, which then goes into an oscillator, uh, an oscillating circuit. Uh, that oscillator will mix the signal from the audio with a radio frequency, let's say 100 megahertz. So if then when it goes to the transmitter, it will transmit on 100 megahertz, but the audio and stuff, the information will be encoded on that frequency. So it goes through the air, like these electromagnetic waves, a receiver will then pick it up, strip out um, the carrier frequency, in this case 100 megahertz, and then what you're left with is the, the information, um, which is the audio. It goes into another transducer, which is a speaker in this case, and that just turns into audio. So that's, that's a, a very basic overview of how transmitters and receivers work. Um, radio, radio waves themselves are just a type of light, in effect. Uh, we can see here, right in the middle, we've got visible light, which is, uh, I suppose, all the colours of the rainbow. It's everything we can see. Um, if we go to the far end, over on the blue side, we've got ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma ray, that they're types of ionising uh, electromagnetic radiation. And we've also got the, the, uh, the sizes um, of, of those wavelengths. So that's kind of the distance from peak to peak on an electromagnetic wave. Uh, so visible light, we're looking at the size of bacteria. Ultraviolet, uh, it's uh, the size of a molecule and so on. If we go back in the other direction, we have infrared and microwave and radio. Now, those wavelengths get a bit bigger. Um, when you look at infrared radiation, um, we can uh, detect infrared as, as heat. Um, we can't obviously see it uh, with our eyes, but those wavelengths are on the scale of the tip of a needle. If we go slightly longer wavelengths, we go on to centimeter scales, which would be microwaves, and then eventually uh, meters and kilometers, which um, our radio is, and that's kind of where we're focusing on uh, today. So, receiving signals. Um, there are a few different types of, of uh, radio receivers. Most radio uh, receivers that you would use um, at home or whatever would probably cover FM bands, AM, and maybe long wave. Um, a lot of them as well, uh, particularly specialized radios, will cover short wave. Um, I have one such radio here, which we're actually going to use to demonstrate. I also have another radio. Uh, plug into my laptop, uh, which is a software defined radio. So, radios like this, which is something similar to what you might have at home, they'll use uh, hardware and electronics to actually decode uh, the signals. Software defined radio, it's this little USB thing I have plugged in here, I can show it to you after. Um, it uses software basically to do what would have already been done uh, by the hardware uh, otherwise. Um, Obviously, with any radio, you're going to need an antenna. Um, I'm sure you all know of these telescopic antennas. Uh, without an antenna, your radio is pretty useless because you need an antenna to somehow feed the information into the radio itself so it can be decoded. Uh, this USB radio I have here has this antenna. It just plugs in, simple as that. And then I have another antenna, specialized antenna, which we're going to use for uh, grabbing aircraft signals. And that's when I built, um, I'll explain how that works in a bit. So, um, let's see. Aircraft signals, let's get into business. Uh, aircraft uh, broadcast, uh, aircraft broadcast um, a type of signal called ADSB, which stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. That means um, it's a type of signal that doesn't require any input from a pilot or, or anything else. Once it's switched on, it's fed by computer and all the information goes out. Okay, it just keeps broadcasting. There's no authentication, there's no encryption, which we're going to look at in a second. Um, so this would be a backup system um, as well as radar. So obviously air traffic control would use radar to monitor the, the airspace around wherever, but this can also be used. And you can get a lot more information out of ADSB than you might out of uh, just pure radar, such as you can get an aircraft's position, where it's heading to, altitude, latitude, longitude. And because we are close to an airport, we're going to demonstrate that now. Okay, so. Actually, what I want to do is, I just want to demonstrate this type of radio uh, receiver before I go into that. We're still going to use the same hardware. Um, this is the USB receiver, and this is a bit of software called SDR Sharp. Um, and quite simply, you can plug it in and you hit play. 
Yeah, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. And you can change your bandwidth, uh, your, your frequencies, anything you want. Uh, so they're uh, broadcast bands, that's FM, probably Radio 1 and so on. These things will go from about 25 megahertz up to about 2 gigahertz, so there's a massive spectrum there of, of, of radio signals you can get. Um, it covers a few different modes. You can see it's got narrow band FM, wide band FM, AM, lower sideband, upper sideband, DSB, probably might know digital sideband, I don't know, uh, CW, which is just uh, continuous wave, which is kind of Morse code and stuff. So there's loads of different modes. Uh, you can get lots of different plugins for, for, for this software to allow you to do a lot of different things um, with radio. Now, what I'm going to demonstrate here doesn't actually use this particular package per se, but it does use another one. Now, you can't run both of them at the same time, so I do need to close one. Okay. So ADSB signals broadcast um, on 1090 megahertz. Um, they also broadcast uh, on another frequency as well, but I suppose the common one in um, this part of the world is 1090, where are you? Yeah, okay, hang on a sec. Okay, looks like I'm not going to be able to show that one, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Try it once more. Oops. I don't think I have any images to, to, to screenshots to show either. Okay, right, that's not showing up. Um, I'm not sure why. It's probably just um, a screen layout thing. Basically, when you start that up, what uh, you're presented with is a small box and when you hit start it'll pull in all these radio signals okay on one tab you've got uh, a list of frames and um, these are ADSB frames um, which come from from the aircraft itself um, they're all encoded in, in hexadecimal so they look like that okay that, that one that's an example one on another tab, you get a list of, of, of aircraft that are in the vicinity, um, such as, it, like, like it'll give you the call signs, the, ACE, the ICAO address and identifiers, it'll give you the altitude, heading, and everything you need to know about the aircraft. With that information, there's also another tab, you click on that, and it brings up a screen and a map of Ireland or whatever your locality is, and the aircraft dotted around, moving around the screen, which is really, really cool. Um, I'm not sure why it's not working now, but we can try it again later, maybe. Uh, so this is uh, a raw signal. Um, it's an example one. The, the, the first part um, is the downlink format, and that's just a header that kind of describes the layout uh, of the rest of the signal. Um, the green bit at the end is just error checking, so we won't really deal with that. The ICAO address is a unique code assigned to aircraft, so if you have that code, you can look up a table and it'll tell you who owns the air aircraft, what the aircraft is, and so on. So in this case, it's um, an Airbus A319 from uh, an airline in the Pacific Ocean. The good details here are in the positional details, that bit in black. Now, that breaks down uh, into a few parts here. TC, um, again, is another header which describes this whole part. Um, SSA is related to uh, the surveillance status and antenna used, again, that's just relating to the broadcast uh, uh, of, of the signal itself. And T and F are time and frame uh, information. Again, they're not really needed right here, but they are needed when you need to uh, decode the altitude, latitude, and longitude in an algorithm. So altitude, latitude, and longitude are pretty self-explanatory, right? We know what they are. They're still kind of encoded. What you need to do is you need to pull out this information and throw it into a, an algorithm. Now, I've actually set up a web page um, that goes into this a bit in, in a bit more detail. I'll give you the link afterwards, so I'll, 
uh, the algorithm and stuff is available there. But as you can see, it's pretty straightforward to kind of get information out of. Now, I mentioned already that um, it's unauthenticated and unencrypted. And um, so literally all an aircraft does is just broadcast over and over and over again. There's no requests sent by air traffic control or anything. And this was brought to, to the attention of the FAA recently, uh, recently you know, probably within the last couple of years anyway. And they don't seem to be too worried about this. Uh, I don't know if it's been a problem um, so far. Uh, they're quite happy that with radar coupled with this, they're not going to run into any problems. But as you can see, if you have a transmitter that will broadcast on 1090 megahertz, and you can make that signal, make a spoof one, you can spoof an aircraft. And it's very dangerous too. It's hugely irresponsible. I'm not going to do it now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it is possible. Um, there are videos online of people who, who have done it and demonstrated working again with a, it, just a setup similar to this, same hardware, and to just transmit from one side and pick it up with this uh, USB radio. So don't do that. It's for learning purposes only. <laughs> uh, other types of signals that you can get um, are weather satellites. That uh, screenshot there is, again, using hardware like this, this USB radio, you can pull uh, weather information from, from weather satellites uh, and, and satellite images. You can also um, decode GSM. You might not necessarily be able to decrypt it, but you can get uh, the data there. Paging systems that they use in hospitals, and I think taxis might use a similar um, technology. You can grab that, again, using that first software that I showed to you with a couple of plugins and this, this USB um, radio. So that's all about receiving radio. Um, transmitting radio is kind of the opposite. Well, it is the opposite to, to, to receiving. Instead of breaking apart a radio signal, we're trying to put one together. And this, is, this is a diagram of a very, very simple and basic um, radio transmitter. Um, on the left, we've got the input, that input, which is just a jack, you can plug that into an FP3 pair or whatever. Transformer is just to match the impedance, you don't need to worry about that for the moment. Uh, battery is, it supplies power, and then the crystal is where the magic happens, okay? So you send a signal into the crystal oscillator, the, the oscillator um, oscillates at a certain frequency, let's say 87 megahertz, okay? That um, audio signal then gets encoded or uh, onto the, the 87 megahertz signal, which is what we call modulation, that gets dumped into the antenna. And then that's it, it's done, it's simple as that. So um, all, all radio transmitters will follow that basic principle. Um, now you can get lots of different types of radio transmitters, but they are that pretty straightforward. For example, this one on the left is just um, a built version of the uh, diagram um, on the previous slide. And on the right hand side there is a radio transmitter that will be used in um, a commercial scale um, broadcast station uh, for, I think that one was from a station in America, I think that's a, a 60s era transmitter. But of course, you can also broadcast using a Raspberry Pi, okay? Raspberry Pis are not meant to be used as radio transmitters, okay? It's, it, it's just something you can kind of hack at and get it to work. What it uses is, it uses the GPIO pin 4, um, which I believe is a clocking pin for clock applications. Um, and what you can do is you can kind of force your Raspberry Pi to, to oscillate that pin at a very high frequency. Um, so we're going to actually demonstrate that now. Uh, let's see. I am going to need a radio. Where did I put this radio? Here we go. So yeah, you can, you can oscillate that pin at a high frequency. I've also, I don't know if you can see it here, but uh, I've also put in a blue wire, which is going to act as an antenna, because um, without the antenna, you, the, the signal doesn't transmit too far. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give this to someone. There you go. Now, 
this package is, is, is readily available. Just Google Pi FM and it'll bring it to the website uh, to, to, to download it. Again, I put a link on, uh, for that package on, on, on the web page that I set up. So uh, without further ado, let's go to, oops, no. Right, uh, okay. So, you download it, unpack it into whatever uh, directory you want, and then what frequency does that read there? 87. 87. So 87 megahertz, throw the volume there, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> as simple as that, okay? Uh, this package will, will, will let you do any frequency up to about 250 megahertz. Um, it'll also do oh, mono. What? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll go up to 250 megahertz to do mono, it'll do stereo. Uh, you can also set it up so that if you have an internet stream and want to broadcast uh, this around your house, you can do it through the Raspberry Pi and using that same package. So it's pretty easy to use, it's very easy to use. Um, it itself is, is, is written in C, uh, I don't know C, I'm going to let you guys play around with that code and see what you, what, what, what you can figure out with it. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, it is, it is very straightforward uh, to use. And um, I believe, yeah, okay, so that's basically just what I told you there. Uh, again, don't try not to transmit stuff too much. Um, it's, there are laws governing transmission. If you do want to transmit anything, I would recommend that you get an experimenter's license or a, a radio amateur license. Um, you can broadcast on some certain frequencies at very low powers, but I would suggest just not doing it. In fact, that was probably the questionable uh, legality. Uh, so, I think that's pretty much everything that uh, I need to talk about today. Um, I've given you a kind of a brief overview of radio, how it, how it works. Um, I've showed you a couple of different receivers. Um, like we didn't get to demonstrate um, aircraft signals directly, but hopefully that gave you uh, enough of uh, an idea on, on, on how it can be done. Uh, I showed you how transmitters work and how to set up a Raspberry Pi as your own household transmitter. Uh, that there is the web page I set up. If you go to tinyurl.com slash DCU Tech Week Radio, you can get all the slides for this. And there's a whole list of uh, resources um, about radio uh, reception, amateur radio, and the whole lot. If you have any questions, I'll take a couple of questions now. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but if you think of any later, feel free to email me, grab me on Redbrick. And if you do yeah, get to do any projects or anything with this information, let me know because I'd love to see what people get to do with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. They'll go like they'll give you all the information you need for examinations, getting your license. There's also plenty of information about how radio works and so on, and also events around the country. There are also local clubs. I think there's one in South Dublin. There's a South Dublin radio club. And yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, like there are there are loads of radio clubs. So if you do ever want to get involved in that aspect of radio, just you know check out IRTS. That's a different type of license. So what I have is an amateur radio license, but there are lots of different types of licenses. You can get licenses for mobile technology, so any mobile phone operators, for example, will have a license. Uh, but for commercial stations like that, um, you can get a commercial uh, radio license. And you, you can, I don't know if you can pick a frequency or if you're assigned a frequency, I'm not sure, but again, it's, it's, it's largely, it's, it's, it's a similar process, you know, just apply for your license and hope to God you get it. Yes? How do you go about getting an amateur license? To get an amateur license, you first need to do an exam, um, that's the HARAC thing, the Harmonized Amateur Radio uh, Certificate. 
it's 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 a standardised thing all over the world, or certainly over Europe anyway. Um, you do an exam of that. Uh, they're organised by the IRTS. Uh, it's quite a straightforward exam. It covers radio usage, how to use call signs, how to uh, actually operate a radio. Um, there's some electronics in it, uh, again, basic service and stuff, and uh, just safety because obviously if you're using antennas with um, high current, uh, that can be dangerous. Also, things like lightning can be a bit dangerous. So once uh, you pass that exam, it is quite straightforward. You then apply to Comreg, and they will just sign you ahead with a license. Um, it's not overly expensive. I think it works out at 100 euro for a lifetime license, I believe. It's either 100 euro or 30 euro, I can't, I can't recall it. It's, it's one or the other. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite straightforward. Yes? Um, I have missed that, but um, what is the difference? Why does most radios use FM radios and not AM? And what's AM for most um, people? That's a good question. Uh, AM radio is probably used a lot uh, by medium wave stations. Those medium wave stations um, will have a lot of coverage, okay? So, so AM uh, modulated radio waves can, can be transmitted very far. So uh, it's great for, for big countries like America or if, if you have a radio station that needs to be broadcast over a lot of, uh, over, yeah, a wide range. That's where you'd use AM. For FM, however, um, it's, it's much more localized uh, because FM is, is, is a line of sight. Uh, radio signal, it doesn't bounce between uh, the atmosphere and the ground like AM signals do. So it's, it's, it's really only for, for local stations. So for example, if you have a, um, a radio station that's based only in Dublin, you probably won't be able to hear it in Cork. However, if that station was broadcasting in an AM mode, you probably would be able to hear it. So it's just, it's, it's, it's for different, uh, different reasons I and mean, I suppose different audiences. Uh, the different technologies have, have have the pros and cons, you know. Uh, in practice, yes. Uh, normally, when we listen to FM, we can get it in uh, stereo as well, whereas you don't really get that with AM. But as far as I know, I haven't seen it in practice yet. But it is possible to fit as much information into an AM signal uh, as an FM. I, I put a side of that. So I'm not sure. Yes. Um, what is it that determines the data capacity? Is it just the height of the radius? How do you mean? Um, like, why, what if I can carry enough enough data? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure of range, and say you could be a uh, country wide radius. Sure. Yeah. What is it that determines how much data that radio wave can carry? Okay, well, you see, there are different types of modulation, um, different modes. Uh, I talked there about amplitude modulation, which is just the height of the wave, and frequency modulation, which kind of alters that frequency slightly. You get other modes such as phase, uh, phase, phase difference in it's, it's PSK. It's also ASK, which is audio, and FSK, which is uh, frequency shift keying and stuff. They can contain a bit more information than just a simple frequency um, shifting or, or amplitude changing. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's all down to the mode that's being used. Uh, I wouldn't know too much about where Wi-Fi technology myself, but I reckon that's, that's, that's where you'd be, where the information would be. Yes? Let's try tracking the planes again. Let's try tracking the planes again. Um, a question regarding that, what, like, obviously you're tracking the planes and where they are. Yeah. Is there any kind of regulation around like who can do it, or is it just anyone that has the program? Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. But uh, by and large, uh, they're, you, you're allowed to receive anything at all, okay? You, like, there, there are very few laws covering uh, receptive radio signals. Obviously, if you hear something that's meant to be encrypted and it isn't, you know, you're not meant to listen to that. Uh, but the, the laws cover transmission more so than reception. So, yeah, you can, you can listen to anything you want. Uh, Trey asked earlier, can you listen to radio? Um, not anymore. Not anymore. They use a digital format, yeah. uh, a Motorola-based digital format that they encrypt with three different ciphers that rotate every 18 hours. Why? Because of the system. The standard system. 
Three three yard track. Let's see. I wonder if this is with track and bangles so you can see the location. So any kind of other information that you can get from them, like this is or is it just the location and um you can guess information on messages. Now, uh, I, I don't actually know what that means, uh, but um, it tells you basically how many messages are being stored by, by the aircraft. Um, sometimes an aircraft will be given an order to make an emergency landing. That would be uh, in that message as well. So, so in those frames, you can, you can actually get that as well. Um, which obviously you can't get from, from, from radar. Um, let's see. I'm going to try this without this plugin. Where's the good place to get antennas? Uh, build them. Build them. Build them. Yeah, they're they're easy to make. You can pay a lot of money for an antenna, uh, which which at the end of the day it's just a couple of pieces of wire, you know. Um, like for example, this one here that I made is a cold in-ear antenna. Uh, it's an, an array of dipoles, um, they're about 7 centimeters long or so, the whole way down. And this, uh, it's, it's tuned um, exactly to uh, 1090 megahertz, so that's a good high gain antenna for, for grabbing aircraft. You can use this, for example, for grabbing aircraft, but you won't get as much range as you can with this. This was just a bit of PVC tube with some coax cable that I had lying at home and it took about half an hour to build and it cost me nothing. Whereas if you were to go and actually buy that, you could pay a lot of money. Um, I'm not sure if you answered this question before, I came in late, but um, what, is, what is the constant for each radio station? You know, you know when you're tuning for a radio station, yeah. they alter frequencies, for frequency modulation, you alter the frequency for different data. Um, how do you specify which radio station you want to listen to? Like, is there a constant for each radio station? Or something like that. How do you mean? And I don't know how to phrase it, but um, each each radio station will broadcast on its own frequency. Oh, so, okay. okay. Even with the frequency modulation. Even with the frequency okay. modulation. Okay. Yeah. What what you need to do is you need to define the bandwidth. Um, that's what that takes place in the hardware inside the radio. So your radio isn't tuned to exactly 100 megahertz. It's mm -hmm. centered on 100 megahertz, plus or minus a few kilohertz, maybe or hertz even. So the frequency modulation, when that, that station is transmitting, the, the frequency will, will alter over and back slightly. But because your bandwidth takes in that whole um, section of, of, of those frequencies, it can pull in all the information. You know. Sorry guys, this... No, that's, that's not showing up, I'm afraid. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put up some screenshots on the web page uh, later on so you can see it. I'll also provide a link to uh, that, um, that software if, if, if you do want to try it yourself. Uh, I should have said as well, these, these USB radios, you can get them pretty cheaply. Um, this one I think cost me 15 euro. I got it on eBay or Amazon or something. And they cost anywhere between say 10 and 25, depending on the seller. Uh, I think they're designed kind of with the aim that you can watch television and stuff on your computer. But obviously, because they cover such a wide frequency band, uh, hackers got their hands in them and started tinkering around with this radio stuff. So, it's cool. Like, I don't, like, I've never looked at television using this before. I've only played with aircraft and stuff. So, any other projects that you're interested in doing with, with radio? That's not, you know, listen to radio tracking aircraft and the weather? Um, I suppose what my main interest is, is in shortwave listening. So what I do is uh, I will use that radio receiver over there. I want similar to that. I got one in Lidl, like, I think, for, again, 15 euro uh, a good few years ago. And what I do is I will listen to stations from all over the world. Um, I, like, I can regularly pull them in from Australia, New Zealand, China. And then what we do is, um, in, in this particular hobby, we we'll send off a reception report with some tech details uh, to that radio station and that will include signal quality if there's any propagation issues which would be related to the uh, atmosphere so any changes in the atmosphere such as sunlight bad weather solar storms 
that can affect radio signals. So we send all this technical information to the radio station and then in return they will send out a QSL card. And a QSL card is um, a card that just confirms that you've been uh, received. QSL itself is just a shorthand code for, I've got you, you know, uh, I received it. So that's a bit of a geeky hobby, like, you know, on a big collection of cards at home, but it's good fun, so. Where's the weirdest place to go to QSL card home? Sorry? Where's the weirdest place to go to QSL card home? North Korea. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a QSL. In the DPRK? In the DPRK, yeah. Um, they're very hard to, to actually listen to because um, <laughs> the signals are jammed by South Korea, usually, okay? So, so you actually don't really get uh, much of a chance to hear the broadcast. Plus, they also broadcast in a lot of different languages. So I, I was listening one day and I just said, all oh, right, I'm gonna try uh, DPRK. And they happened to be broadcasting in English. I got it, I wrote down a report, and you can't email them or anything like that. Uh, so I had to write a letter. Um, you have to glorify I had to glorify yes. this, the, the, uh, the great leader, congratulate him on his recent election win and whatever and uh, sent it off and then I thought nothing of it and maybe about two weeks later I got a letter in the post, no stamps because the dogs don't have any international stamps in, in North Korea, sent by uh, the Department of Propaganda or something like that. Inside was um, a newspaper and the Pyongyang Times, again loaded with propaganda, a little military badge and, and then my QSL card and it was kind of Weird. It was really weird to, to actually get that going, oh Jesus, how many people died to send me this? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think North Korea is probably the weirdest one. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, is there a few more from the public? Do you have any other questions? You can answer them later. Right. Uh, <laughs>